presentation on vision in Parkinson's disease and some of the research that we've been doing in that regard. So I don't have to, I probably don't have to tell this audience that uh, Parkinson's disease is a neuro neurodegenerative disorder predominantly affecting dopamine producing neurons. And I think that you all know that the motor symptoms are fairly well recognized and we're not actually gonna talk about that at all today. What we are gonna talk about are some of the non-motor aspects. Um, they're really not as well understood and particularly we're gonna talk about visual symptoms. I just wanted to point out that one of my favorite performers, Neil Diamond, is no longer touring because he's recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. All right, so visual changes in Parkinson's disease. Um, they're reported to be common, yet you have to take that with a grain of salt because we don't actually really know that much about it. Um, so visual acuity, visual acuity is what we measure when we show you the eye chart. And there's often, um, t-shirts around, you know, and I've made up one specifically for you. Vision is often decreased in PD. So why is visual acuity decreased? Uh, could be because of dry eye. That's a common thing in Parkinson's and dry eye causes or can cause reduced vision. There are retinal changes in Parkinson's disease and that can cause reduced vision. And there are eye movement abnormalities in Parkinson's disease, which can also cause um, reduced vision. The other thing that is reduced is our ability to perceive contrast. Uh, so I've got a demonstration here of two pictures. Uh, this one is fairly clear and the other one looks like somebody put a haze over top of it. Um, this is what we're talking about with reduced ability to perceive contrast. It is the fine details that are most effective. And interestingly, it improves with L-DOPA. So presumably it's related to the dopamine problem. We also have alterations in bl the blink pattern. Um, this is really a motor symptom, but it has visual consequences. So we're gonna talk about it here as well. What happens is you have a decreased blink rate which leads to an abnormal tear film, which leads to dry eye, which leads to decreased vision. Color vision changes have been observed and usually what happens is people uh, feel they have blurred vision for colored stimuli. Um, this is being determined to be related to the retinal changes to the extent that we understand it, because like many of thing, these things, we don't understand it particularly well. So if you're finding that you have trouble um, with reading colors, hopefully most of my stuff is in black and white, the important stuff anyway, so you shouldn't have too much trouble with um, this presentation. The retinal changes. So what we have here is a picture of an eye. And this layer here is the one we call the retina. And it is sensitive to light. And what it does is it takes the light and creates an electrical signal. And that signal goes down the optic nerve to the brain. There are dopaminergic cells in the retina. So you can imagine, um, like all the rest of the dopaminergic cells, they can be affected in the eye as well. And that in turn affects the electrical signals that come out of, of the eye. Now we measure this with something called an electroretinogram. So we put electrodes on the outside of the eye and we measure a waveform, um, an electrical waveform when you send a flash of light to the eye. And what happens is this B wave is reduced in Parkinson's disease. And the B wave is actually generated by, among other things, the dopaminergic cells. So it makes sense that that, that would happen. The other thing that happens is there are actually changes in the visually evoked potential. So this signal 
comes from the eye, goes down the optic nerve through some other pathways and gets to what we call the visual cortex. And that's kind of where your brain sees things. And we can also measure the electrical signals coming from this area in the brain. It's like measuring brain waves. And so we put electrodes on the skull, on the outside, and again, we send a flash of light or a checkerboard pattern as a stimulus to the eye, and we measure the output, which are these, these waves. And again, in Parkinson's disease, they've been found to be reduced. The pupil can be affected in Parkinson's disease. Generally speaking, it is larger and slower to respond. It may be asymmetrical, so you have one pupil actually bigger than the other one. What this amounts to is, um, you can imagine if your pupil is larger, lets in more light, so you may find that you have light sensitivity or glare. The same thing with the slower responses. If all of a sudden you have a bright light, it takes you um, longer for the pupil to respond and you have light sensitivity. Um, what I've studied for a large portion of my career is eye movements. And today I'm going to talk about the eye movements that are abnormal in Parkinson's disease. Um, listed here, we call them saccades pursuits and versions, and I'm going to explain what those are. Um, there are a few other eye movements, but we're not going to talk about those ones today. So saccades are the very fast eye movements that you make when you look from one object to the other. And in fact, they are the fastest eye movement, the fastest movements that the human body actually makes. And we use them to look around our environment. So if you look at this blue dot, and while you're looking at the blue dot, you will find that it's hard to read the stuff above and below it, all right? So our clearest vision is exactly what we're looking at. And so in order to sample our environment, we have to look around it. And we look from one place to the other, and we use saccades to do that. So in Parkinson's disease, what happens is that they are slower and smaller than they're supposed to be. So it takes you longer to get from A to B. Also, you don't always make it all the way there in one shot. So you may have to take, because they're smaller, you get halfway there and then halfway again, and finally you make it to the target. You can imagine that makes life just a little bit easy, a little bit harder um, to be looking around if you're not getting where you want to go in the first place. The second kind of eye movements that are affected in Parkinson's disease are what we call pursuit eye movements. And what these are for is to allow us to follow a moving target. And if our eye doesn't follow the moving target accurately, the target becomes blurred. So that's exactly what happens in Parkinson's disease is that there is a mismatch between the target motion and the eye motion. So the eye is not keeping up with the target, gets behind and then has to play catch up. And the consequence is that we don't see the target as well. The final system that I'm gonna talk about today, and I'm gonna spend basically the rest of the talk on this, um, is what we call the virgin system. And this system acts to turn the eyes in and out. So when we look at an object far away, our two eyes are basically pointed straight ahead. When we look at an object closer to us, we now have to turn the eyes in in order for both of them to be pointing at the target. And the closer you go, the more you have to turn the eye in. Of course, when you go back to look up far, they turn out and back in when you look at something close. Now, if this system fails, what can end up is you end up with one eye turning in and the other one basically staying out. And that often results in double vision. The other thing, less dramatic than double vision, is that if there's stress on the virgin system, all right, so we can actually turn the eye in, but it's hard work to do that, the result is eye strain. 
So just here is a list of the visual symptoms in Parkinson's disease. So blurred vision, we talked about that. Eye strain, we talked about. Uh, double vision, we talked about. Uh, many people complain of difficulty with reading and some of them don't complain of difficulty with reading, they just don't do it. So avoiding it completely. And this in our world, you can imagine is, you know, going to have a significant impact on someone's life. So there is an eye movement disorder, it's actually a fairly common disorder called convergence insufficiency. And what it is, is difficulty converging the eyes for near targets. So I told you when you look up close, you have to turn your eye in, they have trouble doing that. The way we quantify this clinically, so we have three ways of doing it. One, we measure the degree to which the eye would like to turn out if it were allowed to do whatever it felt like doing. We call it exophoria, and we measure it using different size prisms. So the bigger the number, the bigger the prism, the more the eye is trying to turn out. That's not to say it actually does, but that's where it would go if you let it do what it liked. We use divergence system to compensate for that. And we have um, a way of measuring our ability to compensate that. And that's by what we do is we basically add prisms, bigger and bigger and bigger ones until the person reports that they see double. And we, we measure how much prism they can tolerate before that happens. And finally, the easiest one is we measure the closest point to which you can bring a target until the person sees double. And I put the normal values here, and probably this is one of the more interesting ones. Um, it's a simple test, and you should be able to get closer than 10 centimeters. Now, convergence insufficiency in people without Parkinson's disease, we know is relatively easily treated with eye exercises. And I've put a list of exercises here, and I've specifically chosen these ones because they're the ones we actually used in our study, but there are others. So pencil push-ups are the simplest one. You simply hold the pencil in front of you and bring it as close to your eyes as you can until you see double. Once you do, you push it away, and each time trying to bring it closer and closer to you. Beads on a string or a brock string um, is similar, Except in this case, what you do is you bring the bead, you have three beads and you look at three different distances. And again, you're trying to get as close as you can without seeing double. The final one we call fusional virgins training with vectograms. So in this case, what you do is you put on a pair of polarized glasses, which allows one eye to see part of the target and the other eye to see the other part of the target. And then what you do is you actually separate the two targets. I can't do it on this screen, but in reality, you, you separate these. And as you do that, the eyes have to turn in in order to see the target singly. And you keep doing that each time, trying to get these two rings further and further separated while seeing a percept single, singly. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, convergence insufficiency symptoms include eye strain, headache, blurred vision, fatigue or sleepiness when reading, difficulty concentrating while reading, double vision, and avoidance of reading. Almost all of these symptoms are the same as the common vision symptoms in Parkinson's disease. So the ones I've put in red here are basically the same ones that I showed you on that list of, of um, symptoms in Parkinson's. Now in Parkinson's, we know that fatigue is an issue um, as generalized fatigue. So I put this one in yellow because I'm not entirely certain um, that it would be the same thing that would be causing it, but I'm just leaving it in there just in case. And headaches is on this list, but it's not really on the Parkinson's list. So that brings us to our research questions. 
are the visual symptoms in Parkinson's disease caused by convergence insufficiency? We don't know. How common are convergence insufficiency type symptoms in people with Parkinson's disease? Well, we don't know that either. How common is convergence insufficiency in people with Parkinson's disease? We don't know. Is convergency, convergence insufficiency more common in people with Parkinson's disease than without Parkinson's disease? We don't know. Can convergence insufficiency be treated with eye exercises in people with Parkinson's disease like it can be in people without Parkinson's disease? Now, if the answer to, you know, all of these things was yes, and we could actually treat it, then we have opportunity to make a difference in people's lives, presumably. Um, and we, we need to be able to make a difference in their lives because to do these exercises is annoying and boring and takes a bit of effort. So there's got to be something in the end that makes it worth doing. Otherwise, it becomes a bit pointless. So what is actually known? Um, well, convergence insufficiency has been described as being common in Parkinson's disease, so, but there's been no data actually supporting that claim. So there's a little bit, but not very much. Um, and we know nothing about whether or not um, it, convergence insufficient could actually be treated in Parkinson's disease, because if it's actually a neurological function, um, perhaps, you know, working at it, which is exercising, um, might not do anything. On the other hand, generalized exercise seems to be helpful in Parkinson's disease. And so possibly these exercises would work as well. So with this kind of background, we set out uh, to do some studies. And so far we've published it's three papers on the subjects, one on convergence insufficiency symptoms in Parkinson's disease, uh, one on the diagnosis in Parkinson's disease, and a couple of case reports on actually trying to treat it. So there's something called the Convergence Insufficiency Symptom Survey, and it's a list of 15 questions um, about basically symptoms that we would imagine would be um, an issue in convergence insufficiency. So do your eyes feel tired when reading? Uh, do they feel uncomfortable? Do you get headaches? Do you feel sleepy? Basically addressing all of those symptoms that we just measured or I just mentioned. The CISS-15 was actually designed um, as an outcome measure to see whether eye exercises worked in children. And all of the people that, when it was designed, it was designed for people that you already knew that they had convergence insufficiency. We're using it in a little different manner here. Um, we're using it we're trying to use it um, as a more of a diagnostic test. Now, it hasn't been validated in, for that purpose, uh, but it's the only one out there, so that's why we used it. Uh, we recruited from the Montreal General and the University of Montreal Hospitals uh, Neurology and Eye Movement, or Eye, I'm sorry, Movement Disorders Clinics. And what we did is we reviewed their charts and we had 753 of them. Uh, we excluded persons with binocular dysfunction, ocular pathology, other neurodegenerative diseases, um, and systemic diseases known to affect vision. Once we did that, we ended up with 300 participants who were over 50 years of age that had Parkinson's disease. We then uh, recruited 300 age-matched controls, and we administered phone surveys to all 600 people. Uh, we started out with the Adult Lifestyles Function Interview, which actually is a phone version of the mini, mini mental state exam, and they were excluded if their scores were less than 14. So in this case, you'd like to have a, a big score. We ask ocular history questions um, and we ask general health questions. Again, 
those were. So these first three here, we were really, again, trying to um, eliminate these kinds of things that we may have not caught from the, the chart review. And then we administered the Convergence Insufficiency Symptom Survey. So in this case, what the participants did is they rated the frequency of each of those questions that I showed you as never, not often, sometimes, fairly often, or always. And depending on what their answer was, you gave them a score from zero to four, and you add up their total score, and if you get a score of 21 or greater, um, it's considered to be indicative of having or potentially having convergence insufficiency or at least convergency insufficiency type symptoms. We ended up with 87 Parkinson's um, individuals and 94 non-Parkinson's individuals who reported ocular diagnosis in those questionnaires. Um, we removed them from our main analysis, but we decided not to throw the data out entirely and we analyzed them separately. And that turns out to have, have been a good thing. The most interesting information is here um, and the nitty gritty is kind of over here. So this is just to show you that we did a pretty good job of age matching. So here's the main analysis. These are the, this is the separate um, for the ones that had ocular diseases. Um, the average duration of Parkinson's was eight to nine years. People with Parkinson's disease had more other diseases than non-Parkinson's um, disease participants. They were on more medications. Um, they had lower ALFI scores and they had higher average uh, CISS scores. So in our main analysis, what we found, because what we were looking for is prevalence, so what we found was close to 30% of individuals with Parkinson's disease were reporting greater than 21 on the CISS. So that's, that's a fair number, right? Like 30% of the, of the Parkinson's population, where compared with only 7%, if people didn't have Parkinson's disease. So it's, it's a significant difference there. We also found that 39% of those with Parkinson's disease had greater than 21 on CISs if they had another ocular diagnosis. And the, the numbers increased for people without Parkinson's as well. So what this is suggesting is that something else going on here besides just convergence insufficiency. It also says that regardless of whether you have a diagnosis or not, you're more likely to have um, convergence insufficiency type symptoms if you have Parkinson's disease than if you don't. We also did an analysis of the frequency of the symptoms reported. So, most frequent symptoms were eyes feel tired and eyes feel uncomfortable. The least frequent symptoms were headache and double vision. All right, so in some ways this isn't, um, this isn't particularly useful because everyone has tired and uncomfortable eyes in the sample. So whether you were Parkinson's or whether you you didn't have Parkinson's, um, you're still reporting tired eyes. The notably double vision, right? Double vision wasn't very high on the list. And so we probably can't be using double vision alone as a, as a screening tool. So in summary, uh, convergence insufficiency type symptoms are higher in Parkinson's than non-Parkinson's participants by four times. Uh, CI type symptoms are higher in participants with concurrent visual conditions than without, independent of whether or not they have Parkinson's. And this is approximately 1.6 times. It's a little harder to measure, so that's why I have the approximate in there. 
And CI type symptoms remain higher in Parkinson's than non Parkinson's participants with concurrent visual conditions, and it's two times higher. So, our conclusions um, the first one is the CISS 15 is not specific to CI, it picks up other things. So, we can't really use it as a diagnostic tool in that manner. We also found that having Parkinson's disease increases the risk of having CI type symptoms and that double vision is not particularly is not a particularly frequent symptom. So our recommendations from this are that healthcare practitioners caring for persons with Parkinson's disease should inquire about visual symptoms. And better yet, persons with Parkinson's disease should have comprehensive eye exams. You know, and that's a good idea anyway, um, because generally speaking, people with Parkinson's disease are older, and the older we get, the more likely it is that we are going to have other ocular visual problems. So from there, what we did is we offered complete eye examinations of all works, including eyeglass prescriptions, eye health checks, binocular vision assessments, to 80 participants from the previous study. So we had 300, um, and we did eye examination, we did complete eye examinations on 80 of those people with Parkinson's and 80 of the age match controls. This, in this case, they came in um, to the lab to have the examination done, and so we did the mini mental state exam. And in that case, the ex the exclusion was less than a score of less than 24. We administered the CIS, and again, the score of greater than 21 was used as a cutoff for symptomatic. Um, we had a specific criterion for whether or not we were going to um, diagnose the individual as having convergence insufficiency. So their near exophoria had to be four or more prism diopters greater than their far. So we measured their tendency for their eye to turn outward at far, we measured it near, and the difference between the two had to be four or more. Their near point of convergence, that's the closest point you can get until you see double had to be greater than six. And their PFE had to be, so their ability to compensate had to be two times their phoria. So their ability to com compensate had to be twice uh, the amount that the eye wanted to turn out, or at the very least a minimum of 15 prism diopters. And these are standard clinical criteria. Um, and here are some of our results. So again, you see that we were reasonably well age matched. Again, the uh, duration of Parkinson's disease was about nine years. Um, again, the um, MMSE scores were lower in Parkinson's, the CISS scores were higher, the phorias were higher. Now, in this case, a low number would be a good thing. So the Parkinson's ones are showing more tendency for their eyes to want to turn out when they look at near. Their ability to keep their eyes lined up, all right, our measures of that, our, their ability to compensate is actually less. And the nearest point that they can bring their eyes in is on average greater. Now these numbers are averages for all 80 of the Parkinson's individuals. Now not all of them had convergence insufficiency, but when we averaged everybody together, these are the numbers that we got, and these are the numbers for the controls. And the asterisks here indicate that they are significantly different between um, Parkinson's and control. So then what we did is we determined the percentages of 
Parkinson's participants and control participants who had each of these three conditions. So we, um, if they had symptoms only, um, we labeled them, sorry, if they had symptoms, so they were greater than 21 on the CISS, we counted them in this group. If they, if they met our criteria for an objective measure of CI, so on the tests of the FORIA and the compensating virgins and the NPC, they fall into this category. And if they had both, which we called symptomatic CIs, they fell into this category. And as you can see, lots of them have symptoms. Um, a significant number of them have objective signs and however these don't match up exactly and the people that actually have both symptomatic ci so both symptoms and objective signs is about 31 percent compared with seven percent in controls so Symptoms and objective diagnosis are not well correlated, right? Otherwise, all these numbers would be the same, or certainly a lot closer. NPC, so the closest point that you can get before you see double, was the only test finding that was consistently different between Parkinson's and controls for all of these groups. And finally, double vision was only reported fairly often or always in 14% of Parkinson's participants. And you, you may say, well, 14% is still, a, you know, a, a fairly big number. It is, except if you're trying to use it as a screening and you're actually missing 86% of them because that's the only question that you ask. So our conclusions from this study were that um, the CIS-15 is actually not sensitive or specific. So it picks up people who don't have, part, uh, don't have convergence insufficiency and it misses people who do have convergence insufficiency. And so it's by itself, it's not really very useful. Having Parkinson's disease increases the risk of having diagnostic, sorry, diagnosed symptomatic CI by four times. Double vision is not one of the most frequent symptoms in, in Parkinson's disease. And NPC is the only finding for all groups that is consistently different between Parkinson's and non-Parkinson's participants. So our recommendations in this case are that uh, things like the NMSQ, which is aimed at a screening for non-motor symptoms in PD, should probably have another vision-related question added. Um, what that question is, uh, people will need to do some more research before we actually find out what that is, but I think they need to add another one. Um, NPC looks like it has the potential to be a fairly simple screening tool. And better yet, persons with Parkinson's disease should just have a comprehensive eye exam and it would just make them all have an eye exam and it would take care of everything. So we now have these symptomatic um, convergence insufficiency patients with Parkinson's disease. And we offered them eye exercises. Um, to do as potential treatment. <clears throat> um, you know, the diagnosis was the, the criteria were all the same as in the, in the previous studies. Out of the 25 individuals who had symptomatic CIs with Parkinson's, seven of the Parkinson's um, people accepted the exercises, so not very many accepted to start with, none of the control subjects or the non-Parkinson's patient accepted. Um, so 
you know, we started out with 754 people and now we're down to seven. And we offered them home training. So remember those exercises I showed you before? So the pencil push-ups, the, the beads on a string and the vectograms, we had them do that 10 minutes for 10 minutes, three times a day, five days a week for eight weeks. Um, in retrospect, that was probably a lot and maybe we would have had better compliance if we hadn't asked people um, to do so much in the first place. But when we started this, we wanted to make sure that if we didn't get an effect, it was because the exercises didn't work and not because we didn't do them enough. We, to encourage our participants, we, contact, we contacted them by phone weekly to make sure they were doing okay and they understood the exercises and they knew what they had to do. We evaluated them at baseline before we gave them the exercises and at four weeks and eight weeks. And then we offered six months of reduced training. So once a day instead of three times a day um, to anyone who had actually completed the initial training. But as you will see, there weren't that many of them. So in the end, only two of the seven people who started the training completed it, three abandoned, um, two we just weren't able to um, contact. But the people who did complete the treatment, again, there's only two of them, um, their NPC, so the, the first case, the NPC went from 17 to eight. Um, the compensating virgins went from four to 13. And the symptom score went from 33 to 19. The second case, kind of similar things. So the NPC went down, the PFB went up, and the symptom score went down. Perhaps more importantly, um, this gentleman, could read so much better that he bought himself a tablet and so that he could, you know, surf the internet. This individual was actually able to read newspapers after he completed the training, which he hadn't been able to do before that. So our initial data on using eye exercises as treatment, they're quite encouraging. We seem to be able to make a difference. Uh, the home training protocol of this protocol was difficult for participants to complete, and many of them abandoned therapy, and that's a problem. Um, the other thing that we noticed was that family support appears to be a significant factor in successful completion. So if you have somebody helping you and somebody encouraging you, um, they tend to be less likely to abandon and uh, more likely to be able to get the exercises done. So then what happened is we had um, some circumstances which um, eventually resulted in the moving of the study from Montreal to Waterloo. And we have been recruiting from the Movement Disorders Research and Rehabilitation Center at Wilfrid Laurier University. So we now have 14 participants who have enrolled in the training. We still have a fair bit of dropout. So we still got like 50%, greater than 50% dropout. We had eight individuals complete one month of training and we had six individuals complete all eight weeks. I think we still have a few more um, undergoing therapy at the moment, but as of December, these were the numbers that we had. We now have at least enough, enough um, people that we can do some statistics on them. And we do find that we have a significant decrease in the NPC, which again is the closest distance you can focus before you see double. And we had a significant increase in the compensating virgins. And those are the two things that you're expecting to get. Unfortunately, we didn't have a significant um, finding for the symptoms, um, largely because they were really, really variable. So with only six people, I 
it's not going to show up as a significant effect. So our conclusions are that eye exercises can improve eye coordination, at least in some persons with Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's, put another way, Parkinson's disease is not a contraindication to trying to treat someone with a CI. And all of our participants who actually completed the training have shown some improvement. They will not have improved um, to the point where we would say, you know, they meet the clinical criteria for cured, but they have shown improvement. And in at least three of our cases, uh, the effects have allowed the participants to resume reading. Compliance is a significant barrier to success. And family support appears to be a significant factor in successful completion. So our recommendations after all of this is that um, perhaps we need a more realistic definition of success. So if you can start to read again um, that you couldn't do before, I think that does affect um, your life significantly. Um, but in our previous criterion, you would not have actually been considered a success because you don't meet all, you know, the numbers don't meet all the same thing. Um, I think we need to look at alternative delivery models. Uh, and this is to try and, um, you know, increase compliance. Now, one thing about compliance is, is because we didn't know, um, we didn't know if this was going to work or not. So we couldn't, you know, ethically really be um, saying, you know, if you do this, it's going to work, right? But I think we have enough evidence now that we, you know, we can say that we've seen the people that do it, it actually does work. So maybe some more encouragement that way would help our compliance as well. Uh, another possible delivery method would be to incorporate it as, as a station in some other exercise program. And finally, a randomized clinical trial is is necessary to you know finally determine um, the efficacy of treating um, convergence insufficiency in Parkinson's disease. And I think we probably provided enough evidence now that we could convince someone that it would be sensible to do a randomized trial at this point. Randomized trials, of course, are vague and costly and so nobody wants to fund it until you have some idea of whether it's useful or not. So back to our questions. Are the visual symptoms in Parkinson's disease caused by convergence insufficiency? Well, some of them are. Um, probably not all of them, but it looks like some of them are. How common are convergence insufficiency symptoms in people with Parkinson's disease? Well, as much as 54%. How common is convergence insufficiency? Well, it's 44%. And probably the big question here is convergence insufficiency more common in people with Parkinson's disease than without? And four times more, which is a lot. Can convergence insufficiency be treated with eye exercises in people like it can be with, without Parkinson's? Yes, in some people but it's difficult to complete the treatment and family support seems to be a big factor. So if so, does it make a difference to their lives? Well, we don't really know this yet, but we do know that it allowed three of our participants to read again. And for those three people, I think it did make a difference in their lives. Finally, I would like to acknowledge a long list of collaborators, a long list of institutions, and our funding sources. So the uh, Canadian Institute for Health Research, the Canadian Optometric Education um, Trust Fund, and CAREC from um, the University of, of Montreal. Thank you. And